Tonight, we're going to study the topic of the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. And I want you all to think about the pattern that you're going to see in the different passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament tonight. So the wisdom of God is associated with the right path, the wise way, the righteous way, and ultimately eternal life and eternal glory with God and joy and pleasure and power, majesty, possessions, everything good is associated with the wisdom of God. And you're actually following God's plan for you in any dispensation following with what God tells you to do in any dispensation, you become an eternal winner. But a winner in a way that is far beyond anything we can ask or think for, far beyond the winners in this world, far beyond the wealth of combining Jeff Bezos with an Amazon and combining uh, the owner of Microsoft. Well, his wealth is gonna diminish because he's getting divorced but combining all these billionaires and the world together, the riches of the glory of our inheritance in Christ is far better than that. So the wisdom of God leads to eternal glory and eternal pleasure and joy forevermore. And these things we've been studying for weeks and many Bible studies for months and months. The wisdom of the world has as its source, it is a satanic, wisdom. I want you to notice that, how it's referred to tonight, who it's associated with. It amounts to nothing, is what the Bible says. It amounts to zero. It amounts to being an eternal loser. It amounts to being a person that has perished. And where are you? You have no more life because you decided you would follow the enemy and you were blind and ignorant and filled with your own lust and decided you would be evil. You're, you will be an eternal loser. It amounts to a zero according to the Bible, that you're a zero forever. You stay a dead soul, you have no life. The life you had perished and perished on this earth. And everything ends in death for you. And you were suckered by Satan into following him. And that is a terrible state of affairs. But you'll see that's what's associated with the wisdom of the world at its root. It's a satanic wisdom. It turns from God, turns you from God, turns you from the right way where you can have everything to a way where you get nothing eternally but death. So let's take a look at that here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, a reference to the wisdom of God. And I want you to start in verse 17. Let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. So in the preceding verses, we saw when we studied this in the past that Paul was thanking God he did not water baptize anybody else other than Crispus and Gaius. He was very thankful he did not do that. He actually thanked the Lord that he baptized none of these Corinthians other than Crispus and Gaius. And you can read about him baptizing Crispus and Gaius in the book of Acts. But he thanked God he didn't baptize more of them than Crispus and Gaius because he didn't want uh, anyone to uh, think that he baptized in his own name. But then in verse 17, he gets into something about water baptism and the wisdom of the world and the cross of Christ. For Christ sent me not to baptize, and that's with water, because the context of him baptizing Crispus and Gaius was with water, and you can read about it in Acts. Same with the household of Stephanus, and that's water baptism. But Christ sent me not to baptize, 
but to preach the gospel. And you will see everywhere where Paul preaches the gospel, there is never water baptism. Under the gospel, the kingdom given to Peter and the 12, there was water baptism because it's associated with Israel and the end of the world. And the kingdom of priests and kings and the nations through the kingdom of priests and kings. And water baptism is found in the Old Testament. They had to baptize with water before they can get in the tabernacle under the law. It's Old Testament doctrine. It's found in the gospel of the kingdom. Never is it associated with the gospel, the grace of God, preached by Paul in his letters. Sure, in the book of Acts, he baptized with water. He circumcised adult males. He was involved in making blood sacrifices to be all things unto all people. But read his writings. And the truth of his writings are, he was not sent to baptize, but he was sent to do something else, but to preach the gospel. Yes, that's what he was sent to, preach the gospel, which the gospel he's preaching, the Bible refers to it as the gospel that Paul calls my gospel, which Jesus gave to him for you. Steve did an amazing job teaching that on Tuesday, that Christ sent Paul to you. And there's overwhelming scriptural evidence for that. He's the apostle, preacher, minister, teacher, of Jesus Christ to you and for the dispensation of grace. He was given it by revelation of God. So it's overwhelming. You can't deny it. But he was sent to preach the gospel that was given to him by revelation of God that he called my gospel, Paul's gospel, in effect, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. See, that's the thing about the gospel. It does not include water baptism. It has everything to do with the preaching of the cross. You could read about it in almost every epistle of Paul's. Not every epistle, almost every one, from Romans through Philemon. Hebrews is not an epistle of Paul. I don't care how many Bibles claim it is, it isn't. The scriptural evidence says he didn't write it. And Hebrews has a Hebrew gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. But Romans through Philemon, you will see the preaching of the cross, that Christ died for your sins, that he was raised from the dead. He is the Lord, and when you believe that, God's power saves you. God's power gives you the gift of eternal life. God's power gives you God's righteousness. It's all his work on the cross. But the problem with the preaching of the cross that he warns us about is he preached the cross not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. When you study the context here, the wisdom of words is referring to man's wisdom. You can preach the gospel, but obscure it with man's wisdom. Hide it with man's wisdom. The wisdom of words, which are, have their satanic root and satanic source, can make it so the cross is not being preached. And Jesus Christ, when he sent Paul, Paul said he came unto them in fear and in trembling. And he came unto them knowing nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he laid the cross on them. Because in the preaching of the cross, the believer that believes that Jesus Christ is the, the Lord believes that his sins were paid for by Christ on Calvary, then his sins are paid for by Christ on Calvary, by God Almighty's power. The believer that believes that Christ was raised from the dead, then they are promised by God, they shall be raised from the dead, immortal, incorruptible, glorious, shining the perfect beauty of God that God gives them a new body to shine through. So Paul would preach that, but the wisdom of words 
could make the cross of Christ of none effect. What are those wisdom of words? Well, there are a lot of things that are wisdom of words that are not found in the gospel. So it would be something that obscures the gospel by fair speeches and man's wisdom, philosophy, religion, whatever it is, it obscures the cross of Christ. I have a long list of those things. I'm gonna give you practical examples later on, but I wanna cover some things first. Notice in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So the wisdom of the world will say it's foolish, this preaching of the cross. So they consider foolish what is going to give them everything good forever and ever. What is going to give them the power of God, a joint heir with Christ, ruling and reigning in God's majesty in a perfect body, immortal, incorruptible, and glorious. They consider that foolish, which is going to give them eternity in joy and pleasure. They are the fools, okay? They, I guarantee you, well, I can't guarantee it, but I believe with all my heart, when these people are judged, who heard the cross, rejected God by rejecting Christ, and when you reject Christ, you're rejecting God. That's a biblical Jesus, it's God. So they rejected God and rejected the fact God himself died for their sins, and God himself was raised from the dead for their justification, and they reject that. When they get into their judgment, I believe they're gonna know that they rejected all this glory and all this power and all this, all these possessions and all things they could have forever because they were fools. And they thought that was foolish, what could give them the glory to come, what God presented to them clearly. And they're gonna be kicking themselves and they're gonna be filled with absolute torment the thought that they could have had all that, but they rejected God and they rejected Christ and they were suckered by Satan. But unto us, it says, which are saved. And that's Paul's gospel. You can know you're saved. We are saved. It is the power of God. And that gives you a clue as to what things are wisdom of the word of words. See, if it's a power of God that saved you, which it is, Romans 1, 16, it's to everyone that believeth. Romans 3, it's unto all and upon all them that believe. Romans 4, it's if we believe on him that raised our Lord Jesus from the dead. Romans 5, it's to those that are justified by faith. So it's those that believe that preaching of the cross. Automatically, you see a long list of things that are not found there that are com commonly taught in churches. And I, I don't like to harp on it a lot, but, you know, inviting Jesus into your life is not on that list. That obscures the cross of Christ because you inviting Jesus into your life is not the power of God unto salvation. That's you believing that Jesus Christ's power saved you by him dying on the cross and was ra ra raised and him being raised from the dead. You making him Lord of your life does nothing. That has no cross in it. That's not the preaching of the cross. That obscures the cross. That's wisdom of the world. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, if you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you making him some kind of Lord in your life, that makes you saved. No, no, that obscures the cross. It's crossless. If those are the things that save you, what's the use of having all these passages about like Romans 3, where it's faith in his blood, him dying on the cross. Romans 4, where it's us believing that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Romans 5, where we see the work of the cross in Romans 5. What's the use of having 1 Corinthians 15, that this is the gospel of our salvation. He died for our sins according to the scripture and he was raised from the dead. What's the, those are all useless? That's not the gospel? Oh yes, it is a gospel. God presents that as a gospel and it doesn't include your repenting of your sins. That's another thing that you're doing. Inviting him into your heart, you're doing. Repenting of your sins, you're doing. It's a work, it's a work. 
being water baptized for him. No, your apostle was not sent to baptize. It has nothing to do with your salvation. That's obscuring the cross, okay? Uh, you deciding that you're going to walk an aisle for Jesus, nothing to do with the cross. You deciding that you're going to make some proclamation and identification of Jesus Christ by being dunked in water, nothing to do with the cross and that, you know, it's not preaching the cross to anybody, right? So these things are things that ignore the power of God that has already saved us that believe. That's what these things are. Now, here's where we're going to get into an interesting pattern. And I want us, and I'm going to return to some other things, by the way, worldly things, worldly wisdom and wisdom of words of the world. But I find this a fascinating passage, uh, the next passage we are going to read here. Because it's all part of the pattern that I told you about. And that, that pattern has to do with the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. So here, the quotation is in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing. I want you to remember that. Bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. You will find that the path of man's wisdom leads to nothing. It leads to an eternal nothing. Where you turn into eternal, an eternal goose egg. You become a nothing, okay? You're dead and you stay dead. You perish in verse 18. You stay dead and it brings to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The world's wisdom leads to this. But this is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 29 and it's something we're going to have to pay attention to there because it's cited here for a reason it looks at the overall pattern how god is going to prevail and his wisdom is going to prevail forever and the context back there is the second coming of christ and this is a quotation from that and it show you that satan will amount to nothing and all that they do and these dispute, the disputer of this world, who is called Satan, that all that they do is going to amount to nothing in the eternal scheme of things, because God is going to prevail and the enemy is going to lose. Let's turn back to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter Isaiah 29, and why don't we start with verse um, 13? And I'm gonna I'm gonna cover I'm gonna explain what's going on here, and so that we don't have to read read through a lot of it. We're gonna start in verse 13. What's happening is the nations of the world, as you read in many places in the Old Testament, are going to turn against God Almighty and God's people in Israel in the great tribulation they are going to the armies of the ungodly and the satanical forces are going to howl and converge on israel to defeat the believers of israel and they're going to come to fight against against ariel against the city of god against zion against jerusalem they're going to come all these armies from all over the world and they're going to be driven by satan and they're going to think we're going to take out our lust on Israel and on the, the believers of Israel. We're going to be destroying them. God's going to gather all those armies together, and God's going to utterly annihilate those armies. And all these nations are going to fight as, uh, against Israel and come in their lust, thinking they're going to take out their lust on the believers of Israel. God's going to make them like a bunch of drunken people staggering around. They're going to kill each other. They're going to go berserk. They're going to disintegrate while they're standing on their feet. Their eyes are going to disintegrate out of their eye sockets. And you can read about what happens to these people. And it's not a pretty picture. And their blood comes up to approximately five feet high in some areas. They are annihilated. Okay. So it's a background of the second coming of Christ. It's a tribulation. It's a great day of the Lord. Uh, 
and they are drunken and they are staggering, but they're not with wine. It's what God is going to do to all of these armies, these nations that come against Israel. Verse eight. So shall the multitude of all nations be that fight against Mount Zion. And you can read this same thing over and over and over again in the Old Testament. You can read about it, you know, while these armies are going to come up against Israel. But let's start in verse 13. Getting back to the wisdom of this world. And this is the quotation that God puts in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 19. Wherefore the Lord said in verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and their lips do honor me. They're actually religious types of people. They're religious types of people. They draw near to me with their mouth. And with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. They are far from God. Their heart is not with the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvel marvelous work among the people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. And I think this has to do with the cross of Christ. But there's a quote that Paul uses, that God uses, the Holy Spirit does in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, just like those that think the cross of Christ is foolish, they perish. They are going to end in death and they're going to be eternally dead and they'll never have life again. The wisdom of the wise men that turn from God in their heart and turn to the wisdom of the world, their wisdom perishes. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. They're blinded from the truth. They follow another course because they make a decision to turn from God. It starts from them turning from God like somebody that makes a choice to not believe the gospel. And we're going to get into that after this passage. They make a choice not to believe the gospel and they get suckered by Satan. These people make a choice to turn from God. And what happens to them is they perish with their wisdom perishes. It amounts to nothing. And when you read on here and go down to verse Oh, by the way, and this is a, a picture of the kingdom later on when God ushers his kingdom in, right? And you, so you see what happens to the righteous. What happens to the righteous is they have this beautiful kingdom. The deaf are able to hear the words of the book, and that should, would be the word of God. The eyes of the blind are able to see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek increase in verse 19 with joy, the things of God. The poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. You see what happens to those that follow God? All the joy and all the wonderful things and the blind are seen. Just like Jesus healed the blind as a sign of the kingdom when he was offering the kingdom. The deaf are able to hear. Just like Jesus unplugged the ears of the deaf. The meek are going to increase in joy. Just like they heard the gospel and they're told by God they're inheriting the earth. God Almighty is giving it to them. But what about the wisdom of the world? It comes to nothing. And look at verse 20. And this is parallel to the things we're going to be reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the terrible one is brought to naught. Who's the terrible one? The terrible one, that's Satan. What is he brought to? Zero, nothing. And all those people that follow him are brought to zero and nothing. That's what they are forever. Everything ends in death. Okay, for them. And when they're, he's thrown down into hell, he has no power. He's weak. You can read about him in the book of Isaiah. They come and they see him in hell. They say, if you become weak like us, they amount to nothing. That's where the wisdom of the world amounts to. And the scorner, what happens to the scorner? He's around enjoying life. He's is a scorner having joy. Is the scorner having this joy in the Holy One of Israel? No, he's not rejoicing in the Holy One of Israel. The scorner is consumed. That's his destiny. He's destroyed. What happens to all that watch for iniquity? Inequity. What happens to all of those ungodly? They're cut off. That means they're killed and they're annihilated. Now, this is what you're going to see the parallel with this back in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1. But 
think about this. These people have chosen to turn their heart from God. So they end up following the enemy and they get cut off. They get, uh, they get annihilated. They get destroyed. And the word that's used there is they get consumed. Oh yeah, they're consumed. Some of them stand on their feet. They're actually utterly consumed while they're still standing. But there's a, there's a, we're going to look at the parallels in 1 Corinthians 1, and you got to, got to watch it carefully. It's best for you to read this yourself and watch the, and connect the parallels because it gets somewhat complex. It's hard to do if you're just listening to me. Uh, it's hard for you to do that. But I want you to think of this. What happens to someone that doesn't believe the gospel? I want to show you what they're putting themselves under. So if we, we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It's the same people you read about in 1 Corinthians that perish where it's foolish to them that perish. For, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid, hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, and he's the one that we read about, the scorner, and, and he's the one we read about back there in Isaiah, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of who? Of them that believe not. These were unbelievers. They decided it was foolish. They didn't like it. And then they got suckered by Satan and then being further blinded by him. And you see where that wisdom of the world gets them? If they would just believe. It says, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. He blinds them, but they chose to not believe not. That's their choice. And when they choose not to believe, they're following his satanic wisdom. They can call it all sorts of things. I don't believe in God. It's one of the things they say. Oh, I don't need that. That's religions for the weak is another thing they say. Another thing they say is, oh, that might work for you. But I have no need of that. Another thing they say is, oh, I'm a good person. I don't have to worry about that. Another thing they say, oh, my God would never put anybody in hell. My God would never, uh, you know, pour wrath upon people. Oh, yeah, that's what they say, because they don't want a God that punishes evil. They don't want a God that punishes murderers and child molesters and rapists and wicked, evil people, they don't want that. They want that, I guess, just to go on without any punishment. So they'll say a whole list of these things. You know what all those things are? They're people that believe not, and that wisdom gets them nothing eternally. They get them nowhere, and they become eternal losers, and they become those that don't have life forever. They believe not, they put themselves under Satan and allow him to blind them because they chose not to believe not. Now, I mean, they chose to believe not. Now, what if they had believed? Then, the rest of this verse, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, would shine unto them. That would shine unto them, and they get eternal life, and they would get the glory of God. And they would get all this stuff you read about down here. Um, for God, in verse 6, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look for those parallels from that it comes to nothing. Okay? It comes to naught back in Isaiah. They perish, right? They're consumed. Um, here it says, those that believe not, are their, their minds are blinded. Okay, and they're lost. They're lost. Whatever their reason for rejecting Christ, they're lost. They're going to perish. They're not following the path that brings them everything good. They're following the path that brings them everything bad. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So that is a quotation here. Now watch the parallels in verse 20. Where is the wise? 
where is the scribe? So the wise would be somebody in the world who through the world's wisdom would say the cross of Christ is foolish. And what reasons would they give for it being foolish? A long list of reasons. They say, oh, uh, you know, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. Oh, um, oh, I don't, you know, I don't believe Jesus is God. You know, yeah, I go to church. I don't believe Jesus is God. Um, oh, I don't need that. That's for weaklings. Oh, all religions are the same. You've heard the same thing from them. This is the wisdom of the world. This is the so-called wise people of the world. Okay. Where is the scribe? This is a religious person, just like those in Isaiah, that they they honor him with his their mouth and with their lips, but their heart is far away from them. These are the religious people. They were the ones that had Christ crucified. They rejected Christ. Christ said of these people, these scribes and these religious types, he said of them, they were of their father, the devil, and his will they would do. Okay. And that was in uh, John chapter eight. And when they accosted him, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they wanted to kill him because he told the truth because Jesus Christ was the I am. That's these characters here. The religious types, they're here today, they're all over the place. Well, where are they? And where are they in relation to the cross of Christ and the preaching of the cross? A lot of them don't even preach the cross. They say, why are you, they, a lot of them say, that's a disgusting scene. The cross is hideous. Why do you bring up the cross? That's the other thing they say. Oh, it's just a disgusting somebody dying there, being crucified and bleeding all over the place. Or, you know, you don't need that. You just need Jesus. You don't need the cross. Oh, yeah? I guess, guess we should throw away the epistles of Paul. Why don't we get rid of Isaiah 53 as well when he's dying for our sins in the Old Testament? Why don't we get rid of all those passages that indicate how important the cross is? So they say, just believe in Jesus. Okay, what Jesus is that, wise person? And they'll, you'll find out what Jesus is in. It's not really the Jesus of the Bible. But notice this, where is the disputer of this world? And that has to do with the princes of this world. And the princes of this world are fallen angels. And the head of them is Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. And they are fallen angels. The disputer of this world. He was a character that you saw back in Isaiah. Here he is. Where are they all? So where are they all? Well, had not God made foolish the, the wisdom of this world? You know what it amounts to? It's foolish. All these characters, what is it? And what is their wisdom? It's foolish. What does it end in? It ends in death. And it ends in eternal death and the lake of fire. That's where it ends. That's where it gets them. Nothing. A big zero. Goose eggs. But, verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. But wait a minute. Uh, before I go over this, I want to jump ahead a bit. And I want to go to 1 Corinthians 2. And we'll come back to this passage. Because remember we read back there that it amounts to nothing is what it amounts to in the book of Isaiah and the passage that Paul was quoting here. Well, the same thing is here. You're going to see what it amounts to in second in uh, first Corinthians chapter two, um, verse seven, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Um, I know verse six, and we're going to come back to this. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. They're perfect because Christ has paid for their sins and he has created a new creature inside of them that is perfect. They still have the flesh and they can choose to walk in the flesh and walk with God. I mean, walk in the flesh and follow Satan and be a weak soldier in the war they're fighting and capitulate to the enemy and roll over and play dead. Or they can walk in the new creature and walk in the spirit and walk with God and serve the Lord. But they're perfect. That new creature has been made perfect by God. Watch this, though. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That is the wisdom of God. Yet not the wisdom of this world. Do not confuse those two as being the same. They are not the same. Somebody thinks they're wise because they can quote Shakespeare or the Oresteian trilogy or Greek mythology, and they come up with long words from university and they think they're wise by spouting these words and spouting these mantras. And they have degrees from all over the place. None of those degrees are going to get them out of the grave. None of those words are going to help them 
that vain philosophy will not help them in eternity. They're gonna find themselves dead and where are they gonna find themselves? Facing God in a judgment as a fool that rejected Christ. So it's not the wisdom of this world that we speak. That's not what we're learning tonight. No, it is not. Nor of the princes of this world. Who are they? Well, you know, that you can see angels fighting princes of this world, and those aren't men. Those are fallen angels. Those are our adversaries. They have children. Satan has children here. They're called children of the devil. They're all over the world. So yeah, we fight against them in a spiritual battle, but we're fighting against these people in a spirit, these entities in a spiritual battle. And one day, I believe all of us in the body of Christ are going to be part of the greatest war in the history of the world, the war to end all wars. I think we're going to be fighting up in heaven, clearing it out, and fighting on earth here too. That's what I believe based on the scriptures. But the wisdom that we speak is yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world. What does it come to? I want you to think about the pattern we've been studying. What does it come to the wisdom of the world? What does it come to this wisdom of this world? What does it come to the wisdom of the princes of this world, the satanic wisdom? It comes to not. Same word from Isaiah. It comes to nothing. It doesn't do any good. It does everything bad. Verse seven, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Yes, that mystery was given to Paul. Study your Bible and you'll see the revelation of the mystery was given to Paul. He was given the dispensation of the grace of God, which is a mystery in the Bible. He was given that revelation of the mystery. Nobody else does it say was expressly given that by revelation of God. The Holy Spirit revealed it through Paul. And to these people, other, you know, otherwise, yes, they did learn about it. But this mystery was uniquely given to Paul. So if you want to find out about the mystery, you would not go to Peter's writings. You would not go to the book of Acts. Don't associate the mystery with the book of Acts. It's not found in there. You would not do that. Now, Peter said the things that Paul writes were difficult, you know, that people wrestle with them. They're difficult to understand. Paul was given this mystery. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. You understand that? Before the world began. Oh, yes, he did. He promised us eternal life back there. He gave us eternal life without works. He gave us salvation without works back then. He chose us in him before the world began. And this mystery was ordained by God before the world began. But look at verse eight. You know what about the angels and Satan and all of them? None of the princes of this world knew it. Are you listening to me? None of the princes of this world knew it. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified Christ. Peter never preached that Christ is going to die for you and be raised from the dead. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, when Christ was walking the earth, he didn't even believe that Christ was raised from the dead. When eyewitnesses went to them, and when Christ was raised, he had to rebuke these 11, uh, 11 disciples. He berated them and rebuked them because they didn't believe he had been raised from the dead. When he was explained to Peter that he was going to die and all that, Peter rebuked Christ, said, no, it will not be so. And Christ said of him, get ye thee behind me, Satan. So he rebuked Peter as Satan. They didn't understand why he was going to die. But the princes of this world didn't know it. Satan didn't know it. The fallen angels didn't know it. None of these people knew it. It wasn't, it wasn't revealed to the world. It wasn't even revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None of them knew this. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You find one place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where anybody's preaching, just believe Jesus died for you on the cross, who's preaching the cross, and believe he was raised from the dead. You get eternal life for free without works and salvation and righteousness of God put to your account. Show me one place there. Show me that in the book of Acts, actually. I challenge you, you're not going to find it in early Acts anywhere. It's only until you get to about Acts 20 and places, Acts 13, where Paul refers to that they can be justified from all things, that they could not be justified, could not be justified under the law of Moses. So none of the princes, Satan, and none of them knew it. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord 
of glory. So when we look at this thing, when we look at the wisdom of God, it is something that verse 9 says, but as it is written, and Paul would use Old Testament passages to prove things up, the Holy Spirit does, as examples, I have not seen, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Well, when did we get the Spirit of God? When did God reveal them to unto us by his Spirit? When did we get the Spirit of God? Uh, verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even though so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. So it's not only the wisdom of the world that doesn't do this. It's also the spirit of the world doesn't do it. But we have received the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So when do we get the spirit of God? Well, after you believe the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, I mean, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14, after you believe the gospel, the preaching of the cross, you got the Spirit of God. Don't obscure that gospel by putting in repenting of sins, water, water baptism, walking the aisle for Jesus, um, doing an altar call, or any of that stuff. You don't get the Spirit of God through any of that. That's not God's power saving you, making him Lord of your life, inviting him into your heart. I hear it over and over again all the time. I have to teach people, here's the gospel. Because somehow they've learned this inviting Jesus in your heart. And they've attended church for years and years and years. And they say, I have to repent of my sins. I did this and I did this and all this boasting. No, this gospel is lest any man should boast. It's not of the works of any of those things. It's lest any man should boast. So let's go back to first. I'm about to end it because I want to go continue with this topic next week. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians 1, and we're going to end it there uh, with another passage. So, God made foolish the wisdom of the world, because the wisdom of the world is not going to get you all the important things that you need. The eternal life, the immortality, the glory forever, the being a joint heir with God, uh, the, um, the majesty of it all. The ruling and reigning with Christ, that comes through the gospel of Christ. Okay, so none of those things are going to accomplish it for you. But going back to verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. See, the worldly wisdom cannot understand the cross of Christ. It's like when Jesus walked the earth. The, uh, the, the light shined into darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The world by wisdom will tell you all those things. They will squirm away from the cross when you try to share it with them. They will divert you to something else. They will accuse you of being religious. They will say that you're a religious fanatic. They will say all kinds of things on you. And that's just the wisdom of the world coming out of their mouth. They will try to get away from it. They don't like it. I've had people scream in fear over the cross of Christ. I've had people yell about it. I've had people react very poorly. But watch this. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. And you can tell they don't know it. They start spouting all kinds of things when you share Christ with them. And they're quieter. They tell you they don't want to hear it. They don't need it. It works for you, but that's not my thing. But watch what it does. Watch what God does. When somebody believes the gospel, something the world considers foolish, it pleased God by the foolishness the world considers foolish. Remember how we started in verse 17 that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And then we read on how for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Oh yeah, they think it's really foolish, but guess what? It pleases God by the foolishness in the eyes of the world of preaching to save them that believe. That believe. Not the whole list of things that I went over that they do in religious systems. 
None of those things, not the sacraments that they do in Roman Catholic Church, none of those things are listed here. It's simply to those that believe, to save those that believe, just like in Romans, just like in other places in Corinthians, all the way through the epistles of Paul, by grace, through faith, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the preaching of the cross. It pleases God by the foolishness that the world sees as a foolish thing that gives you everything eternally. It pleases God by that foolishness that the world considers foolish of the preaching of the cross to save them that believe. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign they require a sign. Tradition, show us this is from God. And God gave them plenty of signs. Jesus walked on water. Jesus walked through walls. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus controlled the weather. Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes. Jesus cleansed the leopards. Lepers. He cast out demons. He, he gave other people power to raise the dead. He healed all the sick. They, they got all the signs they could ever want. But their heart was far from God. So they didn't like God when he showed up in the form of a man to them. They didn't like God, a lot of them. Some of them did, they believed in him. Others didn't, they didn't like God. But the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And that's worldly wisdom, by the way. It's not godly wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. There it is again, the cross. Are you preaching the cross in your church? Is your church preaching the cross? Or what are they preaching? A crossless gospel? That's a perversion. That's a perversion. The Bible says, you know, Paul said that they pervert the gospel of Christ. Any other gospel is perverted. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block. Yeah, they stumbled at the stumbling stone. The Old Testament warned them not to do that and warned them not to stumble. And a lot of them stumbled at the stumbling stone. But the Gentiles are no better because to them it's foolish because of the wisdom of the Gentiles. And unto the Greeks, that's the Gentiles, foolishness. The Greeks are Gentiles. They are, they, the preaching of the cross is to them foolish. So they're no better than the Jews. Any atheist or anybody that rejects the preaching of the cross for salvation is a fool. And they consider it foolish. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. So again, we get back to his power. That's what the gospel focuses on, the power of God dying for your sins, so that when you believe that his sins, I mean, your sins were placed on Christ and, for, and paid for. When you believe that, your sins are paid for. When you believe that God's power raised Christ from the dead, the Father raised the Son from the dead, then you will be raised from the dead. It's all his power. It's the power of God, and it's the wisdom of God. That's a preaching of the cross. He chose something the world considers foolish because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And I know I'm going, I'm going a little over, but I want you to notice something here. It's God that chose in verse 27, the thing the world considers foolish to confound the wise, including Satan and all the fallen angels. All the fallen angels learned about the preaching of the cross through the scripture and through the uh, what was given to Paul. And it's an example to the angels. The angels learned about it. It was hidden. It was never revealed before until it was given to Paul. They didn't know why Christ was going to die, why he was dying. They thought they got one over on him. They thought they pulled one over on him. But God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, somebody dying on the cross, and an execution instrument. He chose that. And things are which, are which are despised have God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to what? To bring to not, there it is again, the nothing. To bring to nothingness the things that are. Nothing in this world is going to get you out of the grave but the preaching of the cross. But God Almighty, he's the only way. None of the wealth, none of the wisdom of the world, none of that, it, it amounts to a big zero. It comes to naught. There's a word again, comes to naught. Just like we, word, we read about 
the, the wisdom of the princes of the world. It comes to not. The satanical things that people follow all over the world comes to nothing. The religion, it comes to nothing. It comes to nothing, just like we read about what's going to be, uh, you know, Satan's going to amount to back in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. It comes to nothing. It comes to not. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, I'm going to end on this. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus and God, who of God is made unto us. Here is his power working. He has made our wisdom. He has made our righteousness. He has made our sanctification. He has made our redemption. He's all those things for us. That never fails. That will never fail you. He will never fail you. That's the wisdom of God. This stuff never fails because it's God Almighty and his power that's doing all these things. He's our righteousness. He's our wisdom. He's our sanctification. He's our redemption. And by the way, he's our eternal life. He accomplished it for us. And that way, through the preaching of the cross, who are we glorying in him? In what are we glorying in? Our religion, what we did, all the things we did, all the sacraments we did, all the things we did for him. Are we glorying in us being wise and, and studying Socrates and studying Aristotle and the Oresterian trilogy and studying Greek mythology and studying physics or chemistry? Are we glorying in any of that? Are we glorying in our intellectualism, in our degrees and how wise we are? Just reciting some silly poem that amounts to nothing will get nobody glory. No, we're not. We're not. When you, when you preach the cross and believe in the cross, it's God that we're glorying in. All the glory goes to him because he accomplishes it all. That according, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. There you have it. That's what the cross of Christ does. That's what the wisdom of God does. And that's it for tonight. God bless you. Thank you for attending tonight.